Anastasia is a haematology and blood transfusion biomedical scientist. He works in London. He's been in the profession for quite a few years now, uh, but he's still learning things on a daily basis, and I think that's a really good take home message. We never stop learning, even if you're at the top of your game, there's always something to learn about. Uh, he believes in empowering young people, giving them the tools, knowledge, and experience to make informed decisions about their future. And he, he enjoys morphology and transfusion. But when not at work, he dabbles in writing and technology. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And hello, everyone. I know you've just had lunch, so try not to fall asleep. But if you do see anyone sleeping, just give them a little nudge. <coughs> for my presentation, I gave this a few years ago. And at the time, it was just titled Becoming. But then last year, somebody very famous that we know released an autobiography by the same name. So I've had to change the title a little bit. <coughs> so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of my journey. Um, so starting from when I finished university and how I got to where I am today. So it might look very simple to look at this infographic, but you know it's not always been an easy ride. And hopefully I'll be able to portray that to you as we go along. So I graduated from university in 2011. That's my undergrad at St. George's University of London. So I did biomedical science. And um, then I did a master because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. You know, um, there's so much out there. And especially at this stage, it's important to see what is available to you. You might want to work in a lab, you might not. But, you know, there's all, all sorts of other things as well. You may want to go into cheese making, you know. There's a lot of opportunity. And sometimes with students, it's very hard to know exactly what it is to do. I've always been passionate about science and I've always wanted to, you know, do something that is health related. But when I finished my undergrad, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go down a research route or not. So I pursued a master's at King's College London. Loved it, it was amazing. So I worked with zebra fish, you know, following stem cell differentiation. But I found that I'd been in the lab from nine o'clock in the morning to about nine o'clock in the evening some days. And that was too much and I just, you know, I was passionate but not that passionate. So I decided to stick to healthcare. But over my four years of my undergrad and masters, there was one thing or one point that I think stuck out the most, and I've got a quote here. This is from my um, supervisor um, on my master's degree. So every week we'd sit down and we'd discuss what I'd done in the project and on my first week. So what I'd done, I used a working solution, uh, sorry, I used a stock solution of DNA rather than a working solution. For those of you that work with DNA and bacteria and you know how to grow it and you know purify the DNA, it takes a long time to do. And she's one of those people that wouldn't shout at you, she wouldn't scream, she'd just give you a look. And it's just been known as Claudia's look. So I went back to the lab a few years later, speaking to her students, and they said the same thing. She gives you a look. And she gave me a look and said, you know, just remember this, you are a student. I don't expect you to know everything. You know, you're still learning. But once you've made a mistake, just try and learn from the mistake and try not to make it again. It was almost like a threat, but obviously it <laughs> And I think that's very important for everyone, not just the students here, but for scientists as well. We're in a profession where, at the end of the day, um, there's patients at the end of what we do. And if we're unsure, or we don't know, it's always best to ask for help. You know, the person next to you might think you've asked a stupid question. But don't think about the person next to you, think about yourself. You should be able to justify everything you do. And if you don't know now, you know, that could lead onto a lifetime of consequences. But if you ask that one question, yeah, you may look funny for about 10 seconds, but everyone's gonna forget. So, you know, feel free to ask as many questions as you want. You can ask me questions too. <laughs> so, after my um, degrees, I started looking for jobs. And this was tough. And I think there's some things which many of you will relate to, and there's some things which have changed. So, during my undergrad, I had a afternoon lecture for careers. And the person said, you can go into research, you can go into medicine, you can go into teaching, you can go into law, you can go into accounting. You can save the world. What they forgot to mention was that to do each and every step is something else you have to do. So I came out of my uh, master's, applied to so many jobs, applied to 10, but 20, 50, 100, and nothing. Most of the time, people wouldn't even reply back to say, you know, whether you got the job or not. And a few times they would say, sorry, you weren't, you know, successful. And I think it, it was after many, many applications, and I traveled to an interview in Norwich, that one of the biomedical scientists said, you need to have registration to become a biomedical scientist. I was kind enough to explain, I'll send you a few links on the HCPC website and also the IBMS website to explain what registration is. I had no idea, idea at the time as to what it was. And then from there, I was able to, you know, uh, remake my CV and start to look for appropriate jobs. Um, you know, and then the other thing I found was very um, 
interesting and maybe controversial as well. So people ask me for, do you have experience? And I was like, yeah, I've worked in the lab for ages, you know. I know my BSc and then my master's, I've worked in the lab. And uh, so this is an interview at the hospital, which I won't mention. And uh, so they asked me this question. I said, yes, I worked in the hospital. Uh, not in the hospital, sorry. I worked as part of my degrees. I worked in the lab. And the person said, no, 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 no. Do you have any hospital experience? And that really annoyed me because, you know, I've had so many rejections. I was like, you know, it's very difficult for us as students or newly graduates to give you this experience when you're not willing to offer it yourself. And you know, uh, let's say the interview ended very quickly and I didn't get the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I finally got my first break at the National Blood Service in Collingdale, uh, working in the HNI department. So HNI stands for Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics, and I did HLA typing. Uh, so this is for transplantation purposes. And this was a small three month contract covering maternity leave, but I thought it was a good way just to get my foot in the door. And you hear it a lot. Once you've got your foot in the drawer, it's easy to drag the rest of yourself in. And, you know, it's a good start. Um, so that was my first job. I learned a lot. It was mainly just PCR and DNA work, something which I've done a lot of during my master's. So you'll hear later from um, one of the speakers about what you should put on your CV and what's too little or what's too much. And I think, you know, I used the fact that I was doing a lot of PCR, making DNA, making plasmids, and I wrote that on my CV. And that was one of the things that the interviewers for this post picked up on. They said, oh, you've done a lot of PCR. Can you tell me about it? And I was able to talk about it confidently. And I, and I think that helped me quite a lot getting my first you know, job. So don't be afraid to put whatever you want on your CV. No skill is you know, too little. It depends on how you sell yourself at the end of the day. But I think there's more uh, qualified people afterwards who are telling me tell about this. So when that contract ended, I was unemployed for a couple of weeks. And while I was looking for jobs in MLA, and my first job was in diagnostic hemostasis, um, which is in the same hospital I'm currently working in. So at our hospital, it's quite big. Um, we have different departments. So hematology and transfusion is separate, biochemistry is separate, and coagulation or hemostasis is a separate department because we have a huge hemophilia centre as well. Um, so I started working as an MLA in um, COAG, as it's also known as. Um, I covered the out of hour service. So we covered two hospitals, Guy's and St. Thomas's. And um, as the workload increased at Guy's, they decided to um, increase the service as well. Before it was only a 95 service, after which all the samples would get transferred to St. Thomas's, but then they made it you know, longer. And I was working the late, I was one of the first people to do so. And it was interesting because when, when it first started, I didn't get five samples a night, so I'd be sitting there twiddling my thumbs after five o'clock. But as people got to know more and more about the availability of the service, the workload increased as well. And so while I was doing my, um, while I was working as an MLA, I started applying for trainee posts. Now that I knew a bit more about the requirements of becoming a biomedical scientist, I thought, you know, it'd be a good time for me to apply for training posts. And I did. Um, I had one interview at King's, which I wasn't successful at. And then there was an opening at, um, in the blood sciences lab. So hematology, transfusion, and chemistry in the same hospital. And initially I hadn't planned on applying. But then one of my seniors said, oh, you know, somebody senior and the hematology department has been asking whether or not you've been applying, uh, whether you're applying or not. And I said, I wasn't planning to. I said, maybe you should consider it. So I did, and I got the post as a training biomedical scientist. But the interesting thing about this was, um, even though I went to the interview, I had no experience working in hematology or transfusion or chemistry. I crammed in a bit the night before. <laughs> and then at the end of the interview, when they said, you know, tell us something about yourself. I spoke about honey. I spoke about honey for longer than I did about the actual interview itself. So I do not suggest that you don't prepare for your interviews, but I'm just giving you, you know, how you can sell yourself. Um, so I had a cold at the time, and I was sneezing and coughing throughout the interview. And when the guy said, uh, you know, do you have anything else to say? And I said, yeah, I'm a very curious individual. I like to find answers to things. Or if anyone tells me something, I like to validate whether it's true or not. And everyone's been telling me to take honey, you know, it helps with the cold and ginger. So I went to PubMed, most of you know, will know what PubMed is. Um, and I've been looking up whether honey is actually known to have any scientific benefits. Um, and in, it turns out that it does. It's got antimicrobial effects. And then we've talked about different types of honey and how you get manuka honey from New Zealand, which is really good for you. And the honey you get in Sainsbury's and Tesco probably isn't as good. And um, the interesting thing was we, we talked about the honey I didn't know much about HPA1Cs or liver profiles or bone marrows, anything like that, but I knew about honey. And then the next day, when um, I went back um, after lunch, um, my senior in the curry department said, oh, Sue's looking for you. Sue's a manager in hematology at the time. 
And I said, oh, she's probably here to tell me I didn't get it, you know. I talk for the honey. <laughs> so I went to see Sue and she said, you know what, you blew us away. And I was like, hold on a second. It's not an Oscar moment, is it? You haven't got the right, uh, wrong person. But luckily it wasn't. So as a trainee biomedical scientist, you learn about all the generic stuff. And well, one of the things I like to highlight is no matter what department you do your training in, you can specialize in any other department after that. So we've had, tra we've had um, biomedical scientists who are trained in immunology and microbiology and even special reception because you cover all of the required, um, you could say, specifications or required um, things in any of the departments. So it's about patient confidentiality, knowing about health and safety, what you can and can't do, knowing the limitations of your practice, and also, most importantly, reflection. Reflecting on what you've done and things that you've heard or seen. And I think somebody will speak about that later as well, so I won't delve too much into it. So after my uh, trainee post, so I worked on, in, the, in blood sciences, so biochemistry, transfusion, and hematology, we rotated between three, and then we were automatically <coughs> allowed or offered to do the specialist training as well. So I started my specialist training in March 2016, and this was slightly different. So like I said, we only work between hematology and transfusion. The specialist training is more in depth. You learn more about the results you get, and why did you get those results, and how that relates to the clinical details of the patient, understanding the underlying you know, theories behind it as well. So this was um, over four departments in the States as well, which I hadn't worked in for my, since my MLA days. Special hematology is where we do all of our hemoglobinopathies, and um, so, you know, sickle cell screening, uh, thalassemias, and also where we do our um, flow cytometry for leukemias, uh, which I personally find very, very interesting. Um, so I have been doing that, and I've recently finished in July 2019, and I didn't wait too long, and they're like, okay, do you want to start nights now? <laughs> and the thing is, I enjoy nights. I am actually loving doing nights. Uh, during the day, we've got so many people doing so many things. Whereas at night, in our hospital, there's one person in hematology, one in transfusion, and you have two biomedical scientists who work in chemistry. So you know exactly what you're doing, where things are. Um, you know, you're your own boss. You do whatever you want. You know. Um, whereas during the day, there's so many people around, so much going on, and sometimes you feel like you've achieved nothing because you start this thing but somebody else has done it, or you do this and that happens and this and that. It's always chaotic. Not to say the nights aren't busy, a lot happens in the night. You know, you get one emergency phone call, somebody comes into A&E and they're bleeding, or somebody's going into theatre and you have to do manual cross matches or provide blood, and we try and help each other out. So um, in many hospitals now, you have multi disciplinary staff who work between the departments. Uh, some people speaking later will tell you that as well. In our hospital, you either do hematology and transfusion, or you do biochemistry. So though we can't help the chemists, we do help them out with just putting in samples and basic you know, things if they do need any help. And the same, if, if something kicks off in transfusion, then my hematology colleague will give me a hand. If trans transfusion goes quiet, and my hematology colleague has a lot of blood films to look at, and I, uh, then we pop in and give them a hand as well. So you know, you help each other out where you can and when you can. Because we are a team and we're all working for the same goal. Whether you're a doctor, you're a nurse, or a biomedical scientist, or a radiographer, Remember, it's all about the patient. And no matter what you do, um, you know, it's all about the patient. That's one thing I think sometimes you can forget when you're stuck in your day-to-day, -day, you know, testing up all blood counts or biochemistry samples, you're hundreds and thousands of them. Or you're finding results, but oh, you know, your sample's short or clotted. You forget that actually there's a patient behind it. To try, you know, that's what I say to all of my trainees, to all the trainees that come to the lab or MLAs, you know, no matter what you do, think about the patient. I will sit through that, and that is the end. So if you've got any questions, please please. That's me. We could just show our appreciation for a minute. Who's going to ask the first question of the day? Anybody? Okay, I've got one. Yes. I was quite astounded, actually, to see that you've applied for over 150 jobs. Isn't that crazy? Could, do you have any tips that you could maybe tell our students? What kept you motivated? I, I think, you know, after applying for time, I'd probably be in tears. I just, what kept you going to just keep applying? It was a really, really difficult time. And I think, um, I think one of the problems was that I didn't know about the registration route. So I didn't know that we needed a registration for a biomedical scientist. And um, it was hard because, you know, I wanted to go into the field. It was something that I wanted to do. But um, not having the knowledge makes it difficult. And I think things have changed. So I graduated in 2011. And at the time, things were different to what they are now. Now students have access. You know, you get lectures, you're here today. 
you know, we're telling you about this, your universities will also highlight this as well. I think it, it requires a lot of motivation, you've got to dig deep sometimes, you know, getting, getting a reply is one thing, but not getting a reply at all, that can quite, be quite difficult, and many times uh, employers don't reply at all, you know, your email or your application gets ignored, and um, it was tough, and there were many days where I just thought, you know what, am I doing the right thing, should I continue, should I not, but I think as it progressed and as I learned more about it, you learn how to tailor your CV or your application to the job that you're applying to. And then initially, the mistake I was making was I fill in the application form, copy and paste and fill in the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And that doesn't always work because people pick it up. And now that I'm on the other side, and when my seniors look at applications, and you or you see or you uh, screen people that have applied, you notice how somebody's applied for a hematology job, and they're talking about biochemistry, or they're talking about microbiology, and then you're like, you know what, if you're not serious, then if you're not paying attention now, you know, it says a lot about your character too. So you have to pay attention to small things. It may seem small and it may take a bit of effort, but it's worth it in the end. What I might like to add to that is I've had two jobs in my career that have been in biomedical science. For both of those, when I've applied for a job that they've got going in their hospital lab, I've always rung up the person whose name will be on the application, on the job specification, Hi, I'm Cherie. I'm looking at applying at this job. I'm really curious to come and have a quick look about your lab and how it works and see that it's a good fit for me. And I've had a tour. So by doing that and getting your foot in, they know your face. So when you turn up on the day, if you've got an interview, oh yeah, I saw Cherie then. And I kind of like sprinkled little bits of information that wasn't looking like I was selling myself, but as I walked past, oh, okay, what does this machine do? And then as soon as it finished, I hastily wrote down all these little bits. So then when I was in my interview, I went, oh yeah, I remember seeing that machine on, how many samples do you do? And just showing that you're passionate and you're involved and you really want to get behind their department. I think little things like that make you stand out from somebody that's applied, but unfortunately not had enough time to have a tour. Again, I'm going to really push the networking today, but I think things like that can help you stand out. Can I say something to that as well? Yep. <laughs> um, so we've had many students that contact us on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. And you, know, you get to know people, you get to know students. And one of the trainee biomedical scientists who we hired on the last round, she, you know, uh, my manager saw her on LinkedIn and she made herself known. And she initially signed off as an MLA and then worked her way up from there. I mean, you, we live in an age of social media. Use it to your benefit, you know. There's so much out there on LinkedIn, on Twitter, as Sherry mentioned, you've got the IBMS chat. On LinkedIn, you've got lots of recruiters, you've got lots of biomedical scientists. If you have any questions, we're more than happy to help. If not, you know, everyone has a bad day. We may say no at the time, but we'll help you later on. So please, uh, you know, make use of it and make yourself known. And feedback all along the way. If you have an interview and you don't hear anything from it, you think, oh, I wasn't successful, I'll move on. Give the hospital or the lab a quick ring and say, you know, I had an interview with you last week. I know you told me you'd make your decision by the Friday. It's now the following Friday. I've not heard anything. Um, I'm assuming I'm unsuccessful, but can you give me a little bit of feedback that, that I can work with for your next application? It might be that they say, oh, do you know what? You, you didn't sell yourself enough, or you were too shy, or you haven't got enough experience, or, you know, anything that you can work with. And it's just, you know, making that quick phone call and trying to find out why you weren't successful, and you might be able to use that for future applications and interviews. Lovely. Thank Thanks, Anas.